Natalie Battaglia, a research astrophysicist at NASA Ames Research Center. I find exoplanets using the Kepler spacecraft. I'm the Kepler mission scientist. An exoplanet is a planet orbiting another star in our galaxy. So exo means outside of, so it's outside of our own solar system. Oh, that's such a hard question. I was a late bloomer. I didn't get interested in science really passionately until I took my first physics class at UC Berkeley. And seeing how something I, I was familiar with in everyday life like the colors of an oil slick on water, explained by mathematics, to me was extremely profound. And so that was the first kind of taste of science. But it wasn't until I experienced the scientific method and actually uh, was involved with the process of making discoveries that I really got addicted to science and decided to change my path. When I was a graduate student, the field of exoplanets didn't exist. We hadn't found our first exoplanet orbiting a normal star uh, until 1995 with the discovery of 51 Peg B. Um, so I was studying stars, like most of the people who later ended up studying exoplanets. Um, because most of the exoplanets are discovered by indirect techniques, that is, observing something, some characteristic of the star itself and then inferring the existence of a planet, you have to understand the stars very well. And so I was studying stellar activity, like magnetic activity that creates sunspots and plages and flares and, and coronal mass ejections on stars like our sun, but younger, kind of baby, baby suns and teen suns. And that turned out to be really important because one of the reasons why the Kepler mission had trouble getting funding um, in its first proposal cycles was because people were skeptical that you could detect this tiny dimming of light from an exoplanet when you have things on a star like sunspots that are rotating in and out of view and themselves are even bigger than an exoplanet. So it was really important to understand these magnetic features so that we could show, so we could demonstrate conclusively that this technique was possible. I discovered planets using the Kepler spacecraft, which is a space telescope measuring the brightnesses of over 150,000 stars simultaneously, taking a brightness measurement of every single one every 30 minutes. And what we're looking for is a telltale dimming of light that occurs when a planet in its orbit about the star happens to pass directly between the disk of the star and the telescope. The planet casts a shadow out into space. That shadow sweeps across the face of the telescope, and we see that signal as a dimming of light that has a characteristic shape and repeats once every orbit. Kepler is part of this broader search towards finding life beyond Earth, evidence of life beyond Earth. And this is one of the very first steps. You want to establish, if, if you're going to find life, by looking for the cradles of life, the places where the conditions are like they are on Earth, uh, this one example that we have of life in the universe, uh, you want to find planets that have similar conditions. Kepler has a very specific objective, which is to compute the fraction of stars in our galaxy that harbor potentially habitable Earth-sized planets. So what Kepler can measure is the size or radius of the planet and the orbital period of the planet. We get the size by looking at how much of a dimming of light the planet produces, and we get the orbital period by timing the interval between the dimmings of light. So what Kepler considers to be Earth-like is simply in terms of size and orbit. We're looking for things that are about the size of Earth, things that we think would be rocky, have a rocky composition, and are at an orbit uh, where you would receive about the same amount of energy from the parent star that Earth receives from the Sun. So those are the two things that Kepler can measure and the two things that define what we consider to be Earth-like. Our definition of Earth-like is going to evolve as we gain capability, right? We're going to build instruments capable of characterizing atmospheres, for example. We'll look for things like oxygen, nitrogen, CO2 levels. And so as we gain that capability, our, our, our definition of Earth-like is going to become more fine-tuned as we search for those true Earth analogs. 
Kepler is looking for planets in the habitable zone. So that's a very specific orbit where you receive this just right amount of energy. That's different from saying that a planet is a habitable environment. Those two things are different. First, we find planets in the habitable zone. Then we will make observations to characterize their atmospheres to see if there's any indication that that planet in the habitable zone is truly a habitable environment. I'm a little uncomfortable with the term Earth 2.0 or the idea of a backup Earth because I feel very strongly that we need to take care of the Earth that we have, the planet that we have. You know, the discovery of new worlds makes me love our own even more. And it gives me a certain perspective about how delic delicately balanced life is uh, in this cosmic space, in this narrow range of parameter space in terms of temperature and pressure and all the just right quantities, right? Um, so I, I'm hoping that um, habitats are common. I'm hoping that life out there is diverse and robust and prolific and exists everywhere. Um, so I'm hoping there's not just one Earth 2.0, but that there is a range of, of worlds that are habitable and that exhibit a, a huge diversity of life, much, much larger than we can imagine. I'm kind of old. <laughs> I don't know if we'll find another habitable, habitable environment in my lifetime, but I do think that we have a pretty decent chance of finding evidence of life beyond Earth within the next few decades. Uh, we know how to do it. Uh, we're not limited by our imagination, by technology, uh, simply resources. You know, We do it in a metered way, one step at a time. Um, but I think it is possible to, to have that first indication of life beyond Earth within the next few decades. Once you know what fraction of stars harbor planets like Earth, then you can design an experiment that will find all of the Earth-like planets that are closest to us. Those are going to be the planets that you'll want to characterize uh, in terms of their atmospheres. You're going to want to see... Um, you know, if their atmospheres contain oxygen, carbon dioxide, what mix, and, and the like. So the future missions that are important for that endeavor are TESS, which is going to find some nearby systems. Um, JWST, the next generation Hubble Space Telescope, is going to be the first telescope capable of characterizing some atmospheres. So we'll start to get an understanding of the diversity of atmospheres. But for really finding all of the Earth analogs that are closest to us, we're looking at a mission that some decades in the future, some kind of an imager, a big telescope capable of detecting very faint illumination levels that are being reflected off of these planets, and that has some kind of a star shade technology, basically a big thumb in the sky that can cover up the luminous star which is like 10 billion times brighter than the light coming off of the planet, so that you can reveal the faint thing in orbit about it. And, and it's by detecting these signals, actually getting photons that are reflecting off the surface of the planet, that we'll be able to start to disentangle what, what that surface looks like and what the atmosphere looks like. The big question, broadly speaking, is, is there life beyond Earth, right? But, but more specifically, things I'm, I'm really interested in, for example, I, I'd like to know if DNA is the code for life everywhere, right? I mean, we might not find life in the solar system, but we might find death on Mars, for example. We might go there and find fossils. And I'm really anxious to know if those fossils have any, any indication of the carbon-based life forms that we see on Earth, if there's some way of, of, of observing those fossils and then tracing back uh, what the code for life is and if it's somehow ubiquitous in the entire galaxy. All of Kepler data is public. It's in the public archives. Um, people can play around with it. There is a citizen science website called planethunters.org where you can actually look at the data and, and try to spot your own planets. Um, there is a NASA database of the exoplanet discoveries. Um, the NASA Exoplanet Science Institute, or NEXI for short, hosts all of Kepler's discoveries. So you can play around there. You can plot the data in different ways, look at different properties of the planet, and it's one against another, and um, yeah, it's all publicly available.